All right, guys, today we're going to be talking about syncope in less than 10 minutes. So let's get started. So syncope is defined by a transient loss of consciousness with rapid recovery. The key thing that I want you to note is the rapid recovery component of it, because if anybody is having a prolonged recovery or prolonged confusion afterwards, such as a post ictal state, then this is not suggestive of syncope. There are three big buckets that you really want to consider when talking about syncope, and that's going to be reflex syncope orthostatic and cardiogenic. There is also going to be kind of a fourth category, neurogenic slash mimickers category, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. One thing that's really nice to note just straight off the bat is the frequencies of which you're going to be seeing these different causes of syncope. For reflex syncope, this is going to be the most common cause of syncope, and 65% of the time, the etiology of the syncope is going to be reflex. For orthostatic, you're going to be seeing this about 15% of the time, cardiogenic is going to be 10%, and then neurogenic and mimickers is also going to be about 10%. The key thing that we want to do here is really assess for if we think the patient is having cardiogenic syncope, because this is the most dangerous one. So this is the thing that we're definitely trying to rule out when we're seeing patients with syncope. So let's just discuss these three big buckets one by one. And starting with reflex syncope, the most common one that you're going to hear about is going to be vasovagal syncope. You'll also sometimes hear this referred to as neurocardiogenic. You also have situational syncope and carotid hypersensitivity. What I really want you to know for vasovagal syncope is that there is usually a very clear prodrome. So the patient is going to report a sensation of flushing, warmth, uh, maybe they have a little bit of diaphoresis prior to passing out. And this is very reassuring because this is very suggestive of vasovagal syncope. Usually this is going to be induced by some kind of stressor or it's going to have some clear trigger. And it's often postural so that this is basically if the patient is standing for a prolonged period of time, 15 to 20 minutes, then they all of a sudden get this prodrome, prodrome where they feel like they're going to faint and then they do faint. That's very suggestive of vasovagal. Uh, and the other thing is that vasovagal syncope usually is going to be something that's occurring throughout their lifetime and and they have very clear, consistent triggers, and so they can recognize this. Situational is basically going to be vasovagal, uh, but very similar. You know, we see this all the time when patient is having a bowel movement or they're peeing, sneezing. These are all things that are going to kind of trigger a vasovagal syncope event. And then finally, carotid hypersensitivity. This is going to be like on those test questions where you have a businessman who's wearing a necktie that's too tight or their shirt collar is too tight. And basically it's going to be pressing on the carotid baroreceptor causing uh, increase in vagal tone and leading to syncope. Okay, but the key thing that I want you to note is the presence of a prodrome, which again is a reassuring sign. Now orthostatic hypotension is gonna be very much history driven. So the patient is usually gonna report lightheadedness when standing up. They're gonna have some kind of history of poor PO intake, or they've been having nausea, or they've just not been drinking that much fluids, they look dehydrated on exam. This can also happen just kind of in older patients who start developing uh, autonomic dysfunction. So older patients, uh, patients with diabetes, and Parkinson's disease is one that we see this very commonly in. They start to develop this kind of orthostatic hypotension because their autonomic uh, function is not working correctly. And the way that you're gonna diagnose this is you're gonna get orthostatic vital signs. And it's important to know how orthostatic vital signs are actually taken. Uh, this is why in any patient that comes in with syncope, we should just be getting a set of orthostatic vital signs because it's so easy and cheap to obtain. And if you know how to do it yourself, you can just do it right at bedside while you're talking to the patient instead of having to wait for the nurse to come do it because sometimes they don't do it for a long time and you're just trying to figure out where like the vital signs are. So orthostatic vital signs, you want them to be supine for five minutes and then check their blood pressure. And then after that, you have them seated or standing and you wait one minute. And after one minute, you check their blood pressure after that. And this is going to be a very common PIM question, but what is the definition of positive orthostatic vital signs? So what you're looking for is from supine to standing, you're looking for a drop in the systolic blood pressure by greater than 20 millimeters of mercury, or a drop in the diastolic blood pressure of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. You may also see a heart rate increase of greater than 30, which would be suggestive of postural tachycardia syndrome. But definitely the key things that you're trying to look for to be positive for orthostatic hypotension is going to be this drop in the systolic by 20 or drop in the diastolic by 10. All right, so for cardiogenic, the alarm features that I really want you to pay attention to is patient with a history of sudden loss of consciousness, 
with no prodrome. Other concerning signs would be exertional syncope. So a patient was walking or kind of uh, stressing themselves and then all of a sudden they passed out. Or supine syncope, so a patient was just lying there and they passed out. This is in contrast to orthostatic and reflex syncope where usually the patient will be standing up and having postural syncope. Obviously, if they have any chest pain or palpitations, that's also gonna be concerning as well. And increasing frequency uh, would also be concerning. In terms of medical history, if the patient has any history of cardiac disease, this should raise your concern for cardiogenic syncope, any family history of sudden cardiac death. And one way that you may wanna ask patients about this is, did anybody in your family pass away suddenly uh, or drown suddenly? Because a lot of times sudden cardiac death in young people just presents as uh, kind of sudden drownings with no warning. All right, and for this, this is why we typically will have patients be on telemetry so we can have continuous cardiac monitoring. We usually get a baseline EKG and also frequently we'll get an echocardiogram as well with all patients coming in to, with syncope. There are a few things I wanted to show you. So um, here is a picture of the San Francisco syncope rule. This is basically just uh, predicting if the patient needs to be admitted or not. And you can see that any of the patients with one of the five chest predictors uh, should probably be admitted for further monitoring and workup. So if they have any CHF history, hematocrit less than 30, abnormal EKG, shortness of breath, or systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury. Suddenly, just to talk briefly about neurogenic causes of syncope or mimickers, this is really going to be things like seizures. You can also have things like subclavian steel syndrome and vertebro-basilar insufficiency. The key thing that I want you to remember for seizures is that the patient, again, is going to have a prolonged post-ictal state. And one thing that actually may come up is that a patient experiencing any cause of syncope may have a few beats of myoclonic jerks, but just having those few myoclonic jerks is not actually concerning for a seizure unless it's prolonged. So usually if it's just a regular syncopal event, it'll be less than 15 seconds. It'll happen after the loss of consciousness. Whereas with seizures, uh, the jerks will start Start with the onset of loss of consciousness and it will be prolonged longer than 15 seconds and you will also have a prolonged post-ictal state. So just because somebody has a few myoclonic jerks with uh, syncope and it's witnessed by bystanders does not suggest necessarily that it's a seizure. So again, I hope this was helpful for you guys. Uh, just understanding the three big buckets, reflex, orthostatic, and cardiogenic, and then also figuring out how to differentiate between benign and reassuring signs versus more concerning signs such as a cardiogenic cause of syncope from an arrhythmia or valvular problem, uh, which usually presents without a prodrome and has exertional syncope or supine syncope, things like that. This framework also explains to you why we get certain things when patients come in with syncope. So we always get a set of orthostatic vital signs. We usually place the patient on telemetry, get an EKG, and usually get an echo as well. There's this great video by Dr. Strong on YouTube about syncope, and he actually goes over the diagnostic utility of each of the different tests that we get. And you can see basically how cost-effective each test is. So an EKG will usually cost about $2,000 per test in order to determine the cause of uh, syncope. Telemetry is also pretty cost effective. You can see that orthostatic blood pressure is only obtained 38% of the time, but really we should be obtaining it in 100% of patients because look how cost effective it is. For $30, we can diagnose a cause of syncope. So we should keep getting this in every single patient. Echoes are slightly less cost efficient at $17,000. Um, but then moving on to all these other signs, if there's no other reason to be concerned, you know, we shouldn't be getting routine head CTs on people. Look how expensive it is to diagnose the cause of syncope, carotid ultrasound, EEG, MRI, cardiac stress test. Those are all really not indicated. So definitely orthostatic blood pressure, EKG, and telemetry. Probably getting an echo. That's basically what we do at my institution. Uh, but all these other tests would not really be indicated unless you have a specific concern or suspicion for those conditions. So anyways, I hope that video was helpful. This is a basic approach to syncope that I think will serve you very well in your rotations. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any questions. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.